Welcome to HB TV. I'm Harry Binswanger, the HB in HB TV. I'm a philosopher who advocates Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. We have a special guest today, uh, but before we get to him, and I'll introduce him at that time, uh, there was a super chat question left over from a previous session where I uh, criticized religion and particularly the belief in God. Uh, Corey says, with a smiley face after it, or a laughing face, so we don't know how serious this is, Harry needs to be broadcast over the evangelical TV channels. <laughs> Well, if we take that seriously, no, I don't, because uh, those people want to believe. They're not believing through a mistake, and they're not open to rational criticism, with maybe some rare exceptions. And they're the, not the kind of people we're looking for in terms of uh, those who should join the objectivist movement, which is not really a movement. It's an informal uh, association of people who hold a similar viewpoint. So that's not whom I'm seeking to address. But I think maybe Corey got that because of this, the laughing emoticon after. All right, so I'm very happy to introduce my old friend who I've known since 1969-ish, 68, 69, right? Uh, Dr. Lee Pearson. Yeah, really? It's a long time. Listen, go ahead. Who was an undergraduate at Columbia when I was a graduate student at Columbia University, and his just field... to, just to, yeah, just to emphasize how old you are. I was a little baby freshman, and you were an advanced graduate student. <laughs> that is uh, food for thought. I don't know what to say. I'm speechless. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Lee, who uh, will we'll be on a first name basis here, uh, Lee went to graduate school, obviously, since he's Dr. Pearson, and he studied under, at graduate school, James J. Gibson, J.J. Gibson, who was the greatest uh, psychologist of perception and cognition of the 20th century, but uh, William James gets in there as a you know competitor, but he's more the end of the 19th century. It's 19th century, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. he lived into the 20th, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Right. That is correct. So, yeah. so um, and and if in case you're surprised that I mentioned James, James was an excellent author on the psychology, principles of psychology, has some wonderful points, including anticipations of the objectivist theory of free will. So uh, he's well worth reading, very entertaining, he's a great writer. His pragmatist philosophy, of course, is anathema to us, and you wonder how he held both. But that's another story. Today we're uh, talking about a new concept that James J. Gibson introduced that serves the function of bridging the is ought gap, or does it? You know, it's, it's the concept known as affordances, and I'd like uh, Lee to explain what an affordance is, and then we'll go on from there. Okay, thanks, Harry. So yes, I think yeah, I was going to emphasize the same point that this is a, a way of approaching, another way of approaching the is ought gap. It's extra ammunition, if it's valid, it's extra ammunition for, for bridging or, or showing that there is really no, no real gap uh, there. Uh, affordances are, you, you could put it, one way you could put it is that they're perceptual level, uh, values considered at the perceptual level. And we, we don't, have a word for that we didn't have i'm sorry we didn't have a word for that now we do because perceptual values the the valuing that affordances um uh refer to don't fit into the trichotomy of intrinsic subjective and objective 
because um, perception doesn't fit into that trichotomy. All right. uh, I, I think at one time, I think um, Ayn Rand thought it was uh, in the category of objective. Yes. But she realized that's not the case because you're not using the kind of volitional judgment, conceptual judgment uh, and perception, although I think there's volition, but that we will table that issue. It's not the kind of uh, uh, volitional judgment, conceptual judgment that requires epistemology uh, in, per in perception. So it's not objective, but then it's not intrinsic or subjective either, because uh, if I'm correct about this, uh, nothing is intrinsic or subjective. There's really no, no nothing is intrinsic. Nothing is intrinsic. There well, yes. are subjective uh, things. Yes, 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 that's right. Uh, the, actually, the term subjective and I, we don't have to go further with this, but as there are really two different usage, there's an epistemological usage and a metaphysical usage. And the metaphysical, metaphysical usage is perfectly legitimate. There is, there's a subject of consciousness and there's an object of consciousness. And that's, that is a legitimate uh, um, distinction. But in any event, perception doesn't fit into that uh, trichotomy. And we don't, we did not have a word for, for, values considered at that level and Gibson is providing this word affordances and I guess the best thing I can do is uh, read what Gibson has to say because he's actually a very good writer and he can say it better than I can so this is from um, his last book the ecological approach to visual perception and he says the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal what it provides or furnishes either for good or ill the verb to afford is found in the dictionary, but the noun affordance is not. I have made it up. I mean by it something that refers to both the environment and the animal in a way that no existing term does. It implies the complementarity of the animal and the environment. That's from the ecological approach. What page and is that? What, is what page? Oh, I, did, I didn't actually write down the page. Oh. I should have. I, what, you know, the scholar, Shoshan is the scholar. <laughs> anyway, I should have written down the page, but it's in, it's in the book. There's a whole chapter on this. It's called The Theory of Affordances. You can find it easily. And yeah. it's at the, somewhere near the beginning of that chapter. So it's not going to be hard to find. Okay. So we're talking about, in effect, we're talking about causal potentialities uh, for good or for ill uh, in the environment yes. for a particular organism. So, for example, you can perceive or an animal can perceive, and uh, in this case, animals and humans are, are on, on, uh, on a par here. Uh, you can perceive a door as a, or, or a hole in the forest as affording passage. So, if, if, for example, if, if there's a hole in the forest through which an animal can see the horizon, uh, we, we uh, from a discussion that we've already had, uh, that animal would be, would uh, likely be able to perceive the height of that um, opening in relation to itself. That is, is it uh, uh, taller or shorter or the same? Perceives it in relation to itself, and therefore be able to. Um, I'm, I'm fumbling for words. We I just we just don't have the right words. It's, I'm going to say decide, but anyway, decide whether it can go through the hole or not, and, and it, the dog will jump through the hole if it's sufficient. Um, but there are many other affordances, of course, many. A chair affords sitting for a human. It affords curling up on for a dog. So uh, the same thing can have different affordances for different uh, animals. A ripe fruit affords nutrition. An unripe fruit affords belly ache. Fire affords both wealth and uh, wealth, <laughs> warmth and burning. So there is uh, affords this something like uh, values, a, the, a corresponding idea of values at the perceptual level to object, objective value at the conceptual level. Here's another quote from Gibson. An affordance cuts across the dichotomy of subjective objective and helps us understand its inadequacy. So Gibson knew that that was inadequate. Now, he doesn't have the objectivist mm -hmm. uh, Ayn Rand's uh, trichotomy. He's got the standard dichotomy that pretty much everybody has of subjective and objective and does not transfer the word objective, uh, you know, to replace the intrinsic. Uh, he doesn't have that. So he's, he's using objective 
as people do, meaning uh, more or less, I guess, uh, uh, intrinsic. And he's saying it's, it's inadequate. That, you know, subjective, intrinsic, that dichotomy is inadequate. That is true. So then he says um, about affordances, it is equally an affordance. It is equally a fact of the environment and a fact of behavior. It is both physical and psychical, yet neither. An affordance both points both ways to the environment and to the observer. And again, that's from the ecological approach, same chapter. So I think this is very useful. It shows how, uh, just hang on one second. Did you guys, you guys are a little loud back there. Um, it shows how perception is neither subjective nor intrinsic. And, you know, as I said before, affordance, we, we didn't even have a word for this, for what we might call the, uh, I'll put it somewhat contentiously, the perception of meaning. Uh, and this is, gives a, a foundation for objective values at the conceptual level. It gives a clear uh, way in which uh, concepts could be derived from, from percepts, uh, uh, concepts of value. Remember, keeping in mind that concepts, as Ayn Rand says, are condensations of perception. So the way Gibson thinks of it, and this is different from, I think, the way most objectivists would, a perceiver does not perceive shape, then infer meaning. He perceives meaning. He perceives the, the uh, affordance in a, a direct way. You don't, it's not a two-stage process. Uh, I mean, that's good enough to get things started, yeah. if you want to comment on that, Harry. Um, I don't think it's value. It's the value significance Causally, the value significance of uh, something, for instance, you gave a disvalue, it affords a bellyache if it's a certain color of the fruit, indicating its past right. ripeness or underripe. Um, so it's value and disvalue, and it's, it's not of the, of the goals, but of the means, that so-and-so is a means to a value or a means to... Uh, uh, this value that is a threat. The, so it's the the use in relation to action for for life for the organism's life. The use uh, of, of a thing, and um, he even says that air affords uh, transmission of light and breathing and and so forth, which is not something that an organism. Uh, perceives, but in general, he does think that the value significance of things in terms of their beneficial or harmful nature is perceived. And we yeah. agree with that um, in that certain, certain things, certain benefits and harms can be perceived directly because certain causal uh, facts about a th what a thing does can be perceived directly. And that's a, a, not um, a normal position in philosophy. For instance, Hume thinks you can't perceive causal powers of things, but yeah. that, you can, that a ball affords rolling and that you can roll a ball, that you can sit on a chair uh, is something yeah. that can be perceived once it's learned. It's it's available on a perceptual level. It doesn't require any judgment. And I have a quote from Ayn Rand. This is from the appendix to Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. So she was speaking formally, but I think she definitely held this, and it's true. A child can observe perceptually the function of an item of furniture. But it cannot be the first thing that he observes, because before he can observe a function, he has to isolate the objects of which this function is a characteristic. In order to observe that a table is something on which you put objects, a bed is something on which you lie down, he first has to conceptualize those objects. Then he conceptualizes what he can do with those objects what their function is and it gives them what their affordance okay is. now this this yeah. i, I, I read this section we were talking about it 
a little before, and I, I have a hard time with that section. Uh, there she, she moves between conceptualizing and observing. Did you notice that yeah. switch there? Mm -hmm. Well, and, it's, it's not a switch. Uh, I don't, it's I don't, a change, yeah. well, but you see, she, she says you can't observe it. You can't, you have, before you observe it, you have to conceptualize. But then when she unpacks that, it's actually you have to conceptualize some things before you conceptualize others. So she went, she, she went away from observation. And so I'm not, I, in any event, I think I disagree with the idea that you have to conceptualize anything whatsoever. Well, I, I do disagree. Yeah. Animals yeah. can perceive these sorts of things and they don't have concepts. So I don't now, believe it is the case that you have, yeah, that you have that's to conceptualize. That's interesting, uh, yeah. let, me, but, let me, buddy, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sure, go ahead, sorry. Because uh, no. I would not write that as conceptualize, if I were saying it, I would say in order to observe that a table is something on which you put objects, a bed is something. In other words, that this is something, I'm pointing to a table now, is something on which you put objects, and that, if there were a bed over there, is something on which you can lie down. You don't have to have any concepts. You have to perceptually distinguish them. And, we'll come back and that percept this is where she still disagrees with or, or my version of what she might have said disagrees with Gibson because you first have to be aware of the differentiating attributes before you can be aware of what you do with them you don't have to conceptualize yeah, it, in I, my I, view. I think I think Gibson disagrees with that and I think and I think that's yeah, an empirical question I think it's an empirical question, and no. I, I think, but I, I haven't thought this through yet, because uh, we're just talking about stuff. This is why, you know, this is the edge of knowledge we're talking about here. Uh, I don't, I, I think that the idea you have to do the one thing before the other is a remnant of the sensation-based theory of perception. I don't, I think, I think Gibson's view, view is perfectly okay that you perceive the meaning and you don't have to first perceive the shape of something in order to do that at least anyway it's an empirical question but i would say i don't agree with either and, i don't think it's empirical i don't think it's sensation okay. based and i don't think gibson's right i think ayn rand or me okay <laughs> i think uh, i'm right um uh, in, uh, in this uh, chapter he says um he's in disagreement with contemporary psychology because and i can't i have the, just read the quote but i don't see it here because they view that you uh, the thing is its qualities, which is correct. They wish they knew that. And that you have to perceive the qualities in order to perceive its affordances. And he says, no, you, you don't perceive the shape. You perceive the affordance, and the shape is a kind of rarefied uh, perspective on it that comes later. Uh, do, you, do you see that, Lee? Yeah. I don't see it, but I, I remember that I, I did. I did mention. I, I quoted a shorter version of that, or mm -hmm. mentioned a shorter version of that. That, that and, you don't first perceive. I don't see. You that. don't first perceive that. You don't first perceive sort of the. How should I put this? The form, and then, uh, and then infer the 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 meaning from from that. Yeah, you don't because perceive. Heard, form. Uh, we, we, you we, perceive we, inner form. What we have to talk about is shape. Is shape a an attribute of the of the entity, which I would say it is, or is it a feature? Is it is a is it a part of form? Well, that's it's I, both. You know, it's both the, I, the the shape, what we call the shape, we perceive in a certain form, but it is a property of the object, just like its smell or its color or the, those are real take, properties. If you, take, if you take a coin. Mm -hmm. And turn it, make it uh, so that it projects elliptic, elliptically mm -hmm. your eye. So you you experience in some sense. Uh, uh, you can experience, I'd say, uh, uh, the for the uh, coin as a as an ellipse. Now that I would say is a property of form when you turn it. Or uh, let's go back to our old favorite example that we discussed with our, <laughs> our friend at another time. The, the railroad tracks, they look, if you take a certain introspective, I would call it perspective. If you take an introspective perspective, they look, the railroad tracks look like they converge. But normally people don't even, that doesn't, just doesn't, 
no. uh, register. It, yeah. it just doesn't register. But that is a feature of the form. And by, uh, maybe no. uh, I, 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 I think that's misformulated. Um, you can adopt a perspective where you you're calling it introspective, and it's something like that. Yeah. Where, yeah. where you flatten out the three-dimensional spatial array that you perceive. For instance, if you're going to draw it on a surface. And then in, from that perspective, which is a sophisticated thing that children don't do and have to be trained to do, it looks like the lines come together. It looks like the penny is an ellipse. But here I've got something. It's not a penny, but it's a disk. Yeah. When I look at this on edge, I see it a disc on edge, on edge to my eye. I don't see an ellipse, and I have to, you know, kind of, you're calling it introspect, you know, flatten it yeah. out and look at, yeah. do something reductive to to see it as an ellipse. So um, it's not that you that the form is elliptical; it's that it has the form that this has, which is similar in some respects to the way an ellipse looks when viewed head on. The similar forms, but you don't yeah. perceive the, an elliptical form. That, that is. Well, you don't perceive a form in any event. Exactly. But uh, I'll tell you what, I, I would like to discuss this topic of form at another time. Okay. Either at my place or yours, because uh, let's table it for now. Because that way, maybe we can get to more of what we, you know, really agree on about affordances. And yes. So we, we get somewhere. You don't mind? Let's let's do. It's my fault for bringing up form, but let's just let me go on with affordances. Uh, you offer a critique in how we know of affordance, and as far as it goes, uh, the critique is valid, but it doesn't go very far. The critique basically was that Gibson extends it to to cases that he shouldn't, where that are conceptual, yes. like the mailbox. Now, the mailbox, yeah. he actually. That example he actually got from the Gestalt psychologist Kurt Kafka from the, a book that he very much liked called Principles of Gestalt Psychology. So he borrowed, he just borrowed the example uh, from him and maybe didn't think about it too much. But uh, uh, the, uh, the example is actually, uh, as a perceptual example, is valid to this extent. You can perceive a mailbox as, a, um, as having the function of hiding. I think an animal could possibly perceive that if you, if the if the slot were open, that you know a dog could hide his bone there or something like that. That's one of the examples you like, a uh, dog hiding his bone. Anyway, so um, uh, from that that purely, I think there is a purely perceptual, but of course it's also you, you have in order to understand it as a mailbox, that is uh, well beyond what uh, perception alone can give you. You have to understand what postal system and. Uh, letters yeah, that's and right. That's right. All that stuff. So that that's so that right. critique is right, but it isn't really a fundamental critique of affordances at all. No, it's just, it's really just a critique on the edge, on the on that's the periphery, right. so to speak. That's so, right. So, so I think we can, if we can agree that it is a legitimate, not necessarily entirely as far as Gibson, because Gibson liked to push things mm -hmm. uh, as far as he could, sometimes further than he could. <laughs> if we agree that, <laughs> if we agree that it that it does uh, uh, apply within its proper perceptual scope, I think, I think it represents a major advance in psychology and possibly, you know, I, you're the philosopher, I'm the psychologist here, uh, but possibly has some implications, if not for philosophy, uh, exactly for, for uh, pedagogy, for, for, for teaching people that, uh, that the is-ought distinction is invalid for helping people to understand that. I think the idea of affordance can uh, can be very helpful in that respect. And I don't think so far we haven't had that much success in, in uh, erasing the is not gap. Any any help you can get is a, would be a good thing. It seems to me. Any thoughts about yeah, that? Yeah, uh, I don't think this will do it. But I think what he's doing is bringing in the the mind body and the life. Uh, values uh, uh, action dichotomy into well, that's not that's not well say into psychology. He's bringing a proper biocentric perspective into into perceptual psychology, and it is true that perceptual psychology has been too 
divorced from values and life as if the organism existed to make the finest possible discriminations. That's what's often measured, the just noticeable difference. Uh, those things yeah. are valuable to measure, but the purpose of perception is to guide action. Yes, correct. And, and part of the purpose of action is to make per perception possible. It is a reciprocal relationship. Yes. yes. They, they're, they're both true. I, I blame, I, in part, the sensation-based theory of perception because sensations, uh, uh, by all accounts, are meaningless. Yes. And you're supposed right. to go from meaningless to meaningful, and that is a completely mysterious step. So when you say, if one says, well, you, you take sensations and integrate them into a meaningful perception, how does that work? No answer. It doesn't work. Well, yeah, you can't that does not work. sensations. You can't it, integrate simple. sensations. It's just not. Well, even if and if you could, it would you wouldn't get a meaningful perception out of out of that. Whatever you can't, you can't. As someone once said, nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. So uh, you know you have. It's it, I think it's important to establish. It's philosophically important, I think, mm -hmm. to establish that there is something. Uh, I'll use your term because I I like it. There's value significance available at the perceptual level that right. can be perceived. And right. I think that's a, a really important uh, uh, point to make. And that, that's yes. the main point I wanted to make. Yeah. And, uh, not the main, but the secondary point I want to make is, do we, is affordance the right word, which I doubt? And do we need a concept for that as opposed to the concepts value and potential and that i doubt i i it's, it's a neologism that i would challenge the need for but i'm not sure i'm right on that so the points yeah. the two points that are that are good in affordances are that it is about values being integral to cognition Values are integral to cognition. Cognition is for action. And that causal powers can be observed on the perceptual level. You don't have yeah. to figure them out conceptually. Uh, dogs are quite aware, yeah. as you said, of, yes. say, the um, chaseability of a cat or a squirrel. And cats are quite aware of the power of dogs to harm them and make them feel bad things. So, um, yeah, and, and that's the whole, it, it, the purpose of awareness as such is not to contemplate the forms, right. it's to survive. It's, 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 right? it's to uh, move around. To move around in order movement. to get what you need. And movement's to about live. survival, but, but consciousness particularly is about uh, uh, plants don't need consciousness. Yeah. Plants, uh, consciousness can't do any, a plant any good. Not only it that, there are them. organisms, there are sea creatures, uh, yeah, there are sea creatures who, the, the, who are uh, sessile and part of their yeah. life cycle, and they don't have sense organs at that point. And they develop not only, when they... Yeah, not only that, uh, free what swinging, is it? It's the sea, free one of those things, sea, one of those sea things that attaches when it when it attaches, it, it eats its own brain because it doesn't need its brain. When it's moving around in the water, it has a brain. When it attaches, it eats its brain because it, which is a horrible thing to contemplate. But, but it doesn't need a brain yes. when it's attached. Right. Now I forget is that the sea? It's, it's, it's one of those. It might be uh, the creatures, barnacle. You know? It might be the barnacle. Yeah. One of those uh, creatures. Anyway, so yeah, I heard a talk on that by Richard. Yinas, L L I N A S, a Spanish or South American uh, researcher, and he made that yeah. point: the consciousness is for action. Yeah, yeah. So that is a perspective that is beginning to be, thanks to Gibson, in large part, is beginning yes. to be yeah, heard good. in philosophy. And that's yeah, very the whole important. the whole uh, thing that they call an embodiment. Yes, in, in psychology embodied and philosophy. Action. And really comes from cognition. Gibson. The, the yes. good part of it comes from Gibson. There's a bunch of other stuff that's not so great, 
uh, yeah. overlaid, but the good stuff really comes from Gibson. So I think we, uh, you, maybe we don't agree about the term. I think the term is important because we, because the trichotomy doesn't cover value considered at the perceptual level. There's no word for it. It's not objective. It's not intrinsic. It's not subjective. Maybe affordance isn't the right way of handling it. Maybe there's a better way, but it, it's it's a way. And I think it's I think it was a brilliant way. That, I mean, it's a brilliancy by Gibson because he's talking about really the same kinds of things that Ayn Rand is talking about at the conceptual level. He's talking about that there's a, you, you can't just go with the subjective and and what they call objective, subjective and intrinsic. You can't go with that. Mm -hmm. You got to have a, and, um, uh, something else. And, for and those who are not that. familiar with the objectivist terminology, uh, intrinsic is the theory that there is some abstract uh, content that writes itself on the brain independent of your volition and infallibly like a re revelation. So it's, it's a fact out there that requires, that exists without any processing by you. Uh, so if you thought, well, numbers are out in the world. Well, no, numbers are not out. They're not intrinsic in thing. There are no numbers in the world. Uh, subjective means existing only in the mind and not in the world. And objective is a category for what is the world as perceived and judged by a volitional free will having consciousness. That's a short introduction to a, a big, big topic, huge topic. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're it's good. We're at we're the end of, of our uh, half hour. And, um, you know, I, I remain leery of it, but I recognize the importance of the the thing that it represents to uh, that it's uh, the problem it is a proposed solution to and some of it is usable and good from from an objectivist standpoint i mean this is a okay. high class error if it's an error if it's an error it's a much higher class error than the kinds of horrible twisted ugly irrational things we're used to dealing with in philosophy and psychology and psychology both yeah yeah so thank well, you very I much think made, i think we made progress yeah thank you and thank i you, recommend that people unfortunately this book is hard to get a hold of now uh, but there's another one you yes, have the is. senses considered well this is the one and i have an old copy here this is the one that i think objectivists really should read in particular, because it's it's a polemic, among other things, it's a polemic against the sensation-based theory of perception. He explains why perception is not based, you know, uh, by is, it does not occur by the integration of sensations. He explains that uh, in you know great at, at great depth. But this book's even harder to get than the other one. Oh, the, the, the yeah, I've lost my copy. I can't find I my think copy. That, I, think it may be that i think there is a new edition of this now, now i think about it, i think there is maybe a new edition of this out of both of them there's a edition later than the one you have of that of the of ecological this. approach there's a later edition yeah there's a newer edition of that and i think there's a new edition of this and these are you know both extremely good to read if you want to understand perception they're both wonderful and, and so. don't be put off by the word ecological it doesn't mean recycling your trash it no, means it's, it's, an organism in the world struggling to survive yeah it's it just kind refers of what to the, the, the environment of the, 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 the animal within its environment and perception evolved to, so that it could get around in, its, in the environment that the animal is in i mean it doesn't it doesn't it's it's a distinct that uh, the idea there part of the idea was to distinguish what he called the ecological level from the level of uh, that's described by physics. Physics, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, fascinating. And that's a perfect uh, discussion. Yeah, think, yeah. So, but I uh, guess we're. Know, I'm going to go over to. I'm going over to Clubhouse. Yes, you you. Can go I show over the book again? Sorry. And this is the book that I think. If objective, if you can get hold of this. The senses considered as perceptual systems. That's and right. I agree with uh, Lee that he is a, a good writer. He's 
clear, clean, and easy to follow. Yeah. And the senses considered takes up all the senses and shows how they are part of a system of cognition. Uh, ecological approach is just visual perception. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And Thanks I'll a lot. See... I'm going to go over to Clubhouse. Yes. And you're going to go eat, I think. I'm going to go to, yes, oh. to dinner. Yeah. Bye. Yeah, very good. Okay, bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.